Welcome back for week 10, chapter two. Part one looked at objects designed for the home, and now we're going to shift gears and focus on the office. The post-war era, especially in America, was the era of the corporation. Marketing became a big part of how things were sold, and so as a result, how things were designed. The presence of television in everyone's life changed things, and ads on television changed everyone's awareness of commerce, and as a result also, of design. Half of Americans were considered middle class. In 1960, American manufacturers were using 50% of the entire world's natural resources to benefit just 6% of the global population. And after the war, consumption, especially of items produced by domestic corporations, was considered a patriotic duty, something that would help further prosperity. One eighth of all working Americans worked for the 500 largest corporations. And at the time, corporations paid 40% of national federal tax collection. It's now at about seven to nine percent. So when Americans participated in what was called the national bargain, we believed that consuming Coca-Cola would put more money in Coca-Cola's pockets, but then they would spend that money helping us build hospitals and roads and infrastructure. So it's a very different equation than we have today. In the 1950s, GM became the first corporation to gross a billion dollars a year. So we need to look at how this corporate presence related to design and what was happening at the time. We already looked at Walter Knoll in the Bauhaus era. He was not part of the Bauhaus, but he was a furniture maker when the Bauhaus was starting to develop their aesthetic and when Marcel Breuer was starting to explore tubular steel. So he also explored tubular steel in his company. And I bring him into the equation not to remind you that tubular steel can be combined with plaid, but because his son Hans came to America and founded a company that we're going to look at this week. This conveniently helps me tell the story of corporate and office growth, especially as it relates to design, and it also lets me talk about the company he founded, which is called Knoll, which is still around today. At the very beginning, Hans imported furniture from Vienna, and it sold for what seems like not very much money. The chairs were $12, the sofas were $200, but it actually was quite expensive. In today's dollars, that's $200 for a chair, or $3,000 for a sofa. You can see in the pictures, there's nothing extraordinary about this furniture. It was utilitarian, durable, forgettable furniture. But right from the beginning, there's also evidence of a striving for something more and better. The first catalog in 1942 had 25 pieces of furniture. 15 of them were new designs by Jens Riesem. Riesem was a Danish woodworker who knew Alvar Alto, who knew Bruno Matheson, who came to America in 1934. He and Hans met in 1941 and became friends and business partners in this new venture. Riesem's most identifiable chair is from the 600 series designed for that 1942 catalog. And this is a great example of a designer's aesthetic being a combination of personal interest and exploration and clever problem solving. During World War II, materials were restricted for the war effort. So Riesem didn't have access to hardwoods and the things you might need to make upholstered furniture. What he had access to was army surplus webbing and softwoods. So this chair is kind of a triumph of a new aesthetic that was starting to emerge in the 40s. But even more than that, it's a really clever use of the only materials available and letting what those materials could do dictate the form of the chair and the aesthetic statement that it could make. In 1943, Florence Schust, whom friends called Shu, knocked on Hans Knoll's door and proposed adding interior design and working with architects to this equation to help elevate it and take it even farther. She's someone you will want to know more about. Florence Knoll was orphaned at 12, and she went to a boarding school at Cranbrook. She wound up befriending the Saarinen family and ended up moving in with them. As a result, she went on summer holidays in Europe with the Saarinens and had access to that generation of architects and designers. She went on to study architecture at Cranbrook where she met Charles Eames and Ray Kaiser and Eero Saarinen and Harry Bertoia. After graduating, she went to work for Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer and Mies van der Rohe, who had all relocated to the United States by then. So she was uniquely positioned to do some pretty remarkable things in her life. She went to work for Hans Knoll in 1943, and they were married in 1946. So Florence arrived 
at Knoll at just the right time to help further this effort to change direction away from an old-fashioned European aesthetic towards some new undefined future. These are pictures from the 1947 and 1954 catalogs, and I haven't even bothered labeling what these chairs all are because there's just too many, and you'll recognize many of these. Florence was able to get into production a whole bunch of furniture that up until this point had lived only as prototypes or one-offs or very limited production. She redesigned the showroom in 1948 and also hired Herbert Matter in 1946 to transform the graphic identity of the company and he's responsible for the 1954 catalog. If this were a graphic design history class, we'd be stopping for a while to understand and appreciate Matter's transformation of the Knoll visual identity. Hans was reported to be an unbelievably charismatic salesman. It was said that if you went into his office and he closed the door, you didn't ever emerge without becoming a customer. And if you add to that salesmanship better material to sell, some exciting things are going to happen. Florence Knoll was interested in offering complete, unified office aesthetics. Toward this end, she conducted interviews with executives and also with secretaries to understand not just what they said they needed, but what they really needed. They did observational research so that the furniture they designed and the arrangements of them and the combinations could really further the activities that were happening in the office. I know there are way too many images on this slide, but I wanted to be able to combine sketches with finished interiors so you could see how complete some of these fast visions were. Two of these images are tracing paper drawings taped to a project envelope and then photographs for how those projects turned out. They're really similar and I think this shows a unique ability to imagine a complete space and communicate it effectively. There's a lot we can learn from that. Florence then used all of her connections to the world of architecture to get more design happening at Knoll. She called in Eero Saarinen and offered to manufacture furniture that he designed for them. On the right is the production womb chair, and on the left are two pictures of the prototype, so you can appreciate the difference. So much of what that chair would become is evident in this three-dimensional sketch, but so many details are really different. That really clumsy metal base that had so much more resolving to happen before it was finished, but it shows you the important part of this chair, which is the embrace that it offers. Florence Knoll said, I was sick and tired of those chairs that held you in one position. I wanted something I could curl up in. The Knoll website describes this project and says that Saarinen was designing smaller chairs and Florence said, why not take the bull by the horns and do a big one first? I want a chair that is like a basket full of pillows, something I can curl up in. There's some really fascinating narratives behind the scenes with this chair. This is a chair that everyone will have seen and hopefully my students have read about it as well because the story of this chair is an interesting one. This is the Hardoy chair, also called the BKF chair, which was designed by architects in Argentina in 1938. Edgar Kaufman Jr. at the MoMA bought the first two that came to America. One he installed at Falling Water, his family's house in Pennsylvania, and the other entered the collection of the MoMA. Artec Pasco, which was the U.S. branch of Alvar Alto's furniture production company, put the chairs into production from 1941 to 1948. Hans Noll bought the production rights for this chair in 1948 and began producing it, just at the moment where enough people were familiar with this chair to begin knocking it off. The original BKF chair is made of leather, it's carefully constructed with clean welds, but it's a pretty easy chair to make in a lesser version. So by the time Hans Knoll put this chair in production, there were many other people making much, much cheaper versions of it. He took every one of them to court and he lost every one of those lawsuits. So Hans Knoll wound up losing a lot of money on the BKF chair. And that influenced Knoll's direction in the future. So one reason the womb chair looks the way it does is Florence Knoll wanted to curl up and read a book. But this chair is unique because it has not only a design patent, which says this is what the chair will look like. It also has a utility patent, which says this is how the chair is constructed. So anybody who's making a chair that has one form that is seat, back, and arms all bent out of one piece of metal or molded out of one piece of flat material would be violating this patent. And that's going to be much easier to defend in court than a design patent or no patent. That new direction of establishing a legal footprint and then working towards design was an important part of what Noel was doing. And if you're interested in this story, Karma Gorman at UT Austin is working on a new book that investigates the relationship between design 
and law. And the story of this chair appears in an article she published in the Journal of Design History in 2017. The smaller fiberglass chair that Saarinen had been working on before Florence Knoll suggested he just move on to the bigger one was the next project that he completed for Knoll. It turned into what we now call the tulip chair, but it was called at the time the pedestal chair. He wanted to free a room from what he called the slum of legs by creating furniture where all of the bases ended up creating a sort of forest of beautiful shapes. I'm going to admit now, publicly, that I don't like this chair. It's not an aesthetic decision. This was created with a work process traditionally used by architects. Figure out a form, then figure out the manufacturing. And I think that's backwards. This was meant to be fiberglass, but then it turns out fiberglass wasn't strong enough to make the column in the middle, it wasn't heavy enough at the base to prevent it from tipping over, and it couldn't be made in one molded part. So the base ends up being die cast aluminum with as small a seam as possible, and as a result it was much more expensive and fussy and difficult to make. So that didn't matter for Knoll because the price wasn't really the focus, the form was, and the sarin and name was. But for me, that makes this chair a kind of fraudulent exercise. Who am I sitting alone in my office recording this for you to criticize sarin and? I don't know, but I do it anyway. One of the reasons the cost of this chair didn't really matter so much is that there was a great equation happening. When Noel put sarin and furniture into production, sarin and could specify that furniture for his architectural projects. When he designed the General Motors Technical Center in Warren, Michigan, in 1948, he could specify that every single room have furniture from Knoll. Also FYI, for anyone who's looking for more women in design, and I hope that's all of you, another Cranbrook designer, Maya Grotel, developed the glazes for the architectural bricks used in this project. And also she was Finnish, so anyone looking for more fins in the story, there you go. Another piece of furniture produced by Knoll that we need to look at is Harry Bertoia's diamond chair. I mentioned this chair when discussing the Eameses, because Bertoia worked at the Eames office and was developing the wire mesh chair there when he left. He left because he was upset about the attribution that his name wouldn't be on that chair. And then Florence Knoll, who knew him from Cranbrook, said, why don't you come to Knoll and develop some furniture for us? It ended up taking him two years of experimenting and prototyping to arrive at the final design for the diamond chair. And this was made at first in very small batches by hand while he was trying to develop mass production techniques. In the end, it could not be produced with mass production techniques, and it is made to this day all by hand. Each rod in these chairs is hand bent to its own unique shape, used twice because the chairs are symmetrical, but still that's a lot of hand bending on custom made jigs for each part. And then they're all clamped individually onto a welding jig so they can be assembled into the final form. Originally, the chair had two wires around the perimeter that sandwiched the rods. That was later switched to a single wire and welded at each connection point because that proved a faster way to assemble these. So by contrast, here's the Eames chair again, which was created with manufacturing in mind to help keep the cost down. Their wire was formed into a flat sheet created in an arrangement that allowed it to then be pressed into its three-dimensional form, and the loose ends of the wire are captured in a metal channel that goes around the chair. But again, the Knoll equation was not to produce the most cost-effective chair. It was a really beautiful chair. The first three versions in production were the side chair, the diamond chair, and the bird chair. They've been in production ever since, and they've been very successful. Later versions were added, the bar stool was added in 1962, and pretty amazingly the chaise was designed in 1952, but it wasn't put into production until 2005. After the diamond chair, Bertoia didn't design any more furniture. He shifted completely to fine art and produced hundreds and hundreds of extraordinary sculptures. Many of his sculptures are called sonambients because they make noise, they produce sound. They're mostly designed to be outdoors where the wind might activate them. One of my great frustrations with our modern world is that Bertoia sculptures are so valuable that they only live in private collections and museums. So if I'm ever lucky enough to encounter one in person, it's in a museum where it has been robbed of its primary function. It will never have enough wind movement from the air conditioning to produce the sound it was born to create. So I want to warn you that if you find yourself at the Art Institute of Chicago and you encounter a beautiful Bertoia willow sculpture, you could blow on it hard enough to make noise, but you'd probably then be asked to leave. 
If we were in class, I would let this whole video play because it shows Bertoia in all of his beautiful eccentricity demonstrating his sonambience in 1971. I'm just going to play a moment of it with sound and then add a link so you can watch the rest later. If we get back to the Knoll story, Florence Knoll was completely central to the story of its development and its success. Hans Knoll died in 1955 in a car crash, and Florence stepped in and took over the company. She lived to be 102 years old. And so last week when I was encouraging everyone to make a list of the people they want to meet and go find them, I had Florence Knoll in mind because she was on my list for decades. Time waits for no Matthew to meet his design icons. Let's look at the work that Florence Knoll designed herself. She is only now, in the last maybe 10 years, becoming a celebrated designer. Up until that point, her design work was largely forgotten, and many of her designs had been uncredited for decades. Her designs are less innovative. They're not exciting forms. They're not radical new material use. That was intentional. What kept her out of the canon of great designers for so long was exactly what she was trying to accomplish with her designs. She called her work the meat and potatoes of Knoll's output. They could afford to produce a high-end, fussy, craft chair designed by Harry Bertoia and sell not as many of them and not make as much money selling them because it then enabled them to sell even more of the humble meat and potatoes Florence Knoll furniture that they made much more profit on. And her designs are really lovely. They are the least amount of structure and fuss and manufacturing to produce a large amount of mid-century pizzazz. Another reason it was difficult to include Florence Knoll's work for so many years is that this aesthetic and manufacturing is really easy to knock off. So a real Florence Knoll sofa is exponentially more beautiful in its detailing and subtlety than the other sofas that look like this but they look enough like this that they're easy to confuse. And this is what made the Knoll equation so successful. A corporation might buy two expensive Mies van der Rohe Barcelona chairs in leather and chromed steel, and one Mies van der Rohe Barcelona table to match, and then every other thing they have around it just disappears into the background supporting it and suggesting that they're all of equal quality and similar because the materials match and the proportions match and the subtleties are similar. But the furniture that Florence designed was more affordable and more profitable. Florence Knoll established something called the planning unit for interior design in 1946 because she realized that it was one thing to sell furniture, but it was a whole other situation if you could sell the design that required the furniture. The planning unit allowed architects of new buildings to imagine fitting the whole building out while they were designing it instead of leaving that up to the clients to do later. They established showrooms in major cities around the globe and the Knoll look became so prevalent that it really is what we think of as the look of mid-century corporate America. If you watched Mad Men, there is a reason all of the sets on that television show look like these pictures of Knoll interiors. It was an intentional effort to identify the most iconic 1950s corporate interior and recreate it as a set. Florence Knoll won three Good Design Awards from the MoMA, and Knoll established a level of success and an aesthetic that lasted for decades. In 1981, when they published a, a company overview, they were making 4,000 different items that required over 31,000 separate parts. And of those 31,000 parts, only 5,000 were standard items like screws. Everything else was custom made by Knoll for their furniture. They were using over 3 million square feet of veneer plywood a year, over 2 million pounds of steel. The statistics go on and on. Knoll was and remains a very successful business. Last week with the Eameses and Plywood, we looked at Herman Miller, but we have to revisit Herman Miller to see how they also are helping to forward the development of the mid-century aesthetic in a corporate landscape. George Nelson took Herman Miller in a really big way into the world of offices and corporations. And Nelson came to the attention of Herman Miller in a really interesting way. Initially, 
Nelson proposed re-examining the actual walls in our houses. He decided that our walls weren't doing enough for us. They were merely holding up our roofs and dividing our spaces. He wrote a book with the architect Henry Wright called Tomorrow's House, which proposed that our walls become storage walls. So in addition to holding up our roof and separating my room from my sister's room, we could have a wall that stored all of our stuff. Life Magazine wrote a feature on the idea of the storage wall and added some pretty exciting photographs to that feature. And that brought Nelson's work to the attention of Herman Miller. I don't know if you remember all the way back in Bauhaus Week when I talked about Gilbert Rohde, who was design director at Herman Miller. He died in 1944 of a heart attack, and Herman Miller had found tremendous success with Gilbert Rohde as their lead designer. So suddenly they had to find a replacement fast, and they approached George Nelson to become their next design director. The problem was that Herman Miller was a furniture company and not in a position to sell architecture or entire walls. So George Nelson revised his idea of the storage wall to make it into a thing, to make it something that Herman Miller could sell. And it was developed from 1949 on, but finally available in 1959, sold as the CSS, the Comprehensive Storage System. So it's like a shelving system, but it has more features. It has multiple components that can be installed a number of different ways to create something that would help your wall become a storage situation, but also enable it to become a desk or an entertainment center. So we're going to look at how that affected office design, but for some context, here's what office furniture looked like at the time, and I'm not kidding. These are offices in 1940 and 1950 to show you that desks were rectangles, usually of metal, because that's less likely to catch fire, and offices were really sterile, regularized environments where design really had no place. And look at that piece of equipment the woman on the right is using. I think it may be an early punch card uh, machine, but it may also just be a very large tabulating calculator. Even by the 60s, when whole environments were being considered, things weren't all that different in an office, even when they were designed. So Steelcase's claim to fame in 1963 was that they painted some stuff three colors, the classic colors of the 60s, harvest gold, avocado green, and burnt orange. Herman Miller decided to change this. And this involved the hiring of a man named Bob Probst, who had been a professor at the University of Colorado. And he was a researcher and an inventor. He invented a lot of things, uh, a new way to produce concrete, uh, better pilot seats for airplanes, tree stump moving equipment. He had worked for Stanley Aviation during the war, and that informed a lot of his research. And he wrote about that. Here were large numbers of intelligent people working on complex tasks, acres of them, hunched over drawing boards, trying to create, it was a portrait of very expensive, critical employees working in an environment that was very much at cross purposes. He brought his research abilities to this Herman Miller initiative to rethink the office. The problem with that was he was a researcher, and researchers are prone to continue their research and not arrive at conclusions. So props plugged away at reevaluating the office and reimagining what the office could be, but George Nelson needed to produce some stuff and sell it. So Nelson took Propp's research and produced a line of furniture called the Action Office, which came out in 1964. Just as an aside, the catalog for the Action Office is insanely beautiful, and you can see all of it on the Henry Ford Museum website. The ad copy for Action Office in 1966 said, Foot bars and armrests, bumper edges and recessed legs encourage relaxed, active posture. A variety of working attitudes evolve from coordinated equipment of different heights, widths, and functions. Preserving independent work situations, forming open-sided work areas, and supporting the attainment of meaningful activity. Action Office provides a new world in which to work. In addition to the lovely grammatical phrasing of that quotation, the language talks about the important aspects of this design, which is that it introduced flexibility to the workspace. You could have a tall desk where you needed to work standing up. You could have a seated desk for typing. You could have a desk with a bookshelf above it. You could have a desk that worked as a bookshelf for the person next to you. And you could have all these things in any arrangement you wanted to support the kind of work you were doing in that space. It's also worth pointing out that the Action Office furniture used a lot of cast aluminum. This is the same time period as the Eames aluminum furniture. It's the same time period as all of the Alcoa forecast explorations of how we could get more aluminum into produced items. And George Nelson was an active proponent of aluminum use in design. And that produced some really beautiful shapes for the Action Office. It also made it expensive to produce. 
it wasn't as successful as Herman Miller had hoped. And so it was revisited. And I'm sorry I don't have better pictures. These are the only ones I've been able to find of the revised Action Office from 1965, where the legs are now made in stamped steel. So it's a much less expensive production method. And as a result, also, much less substantial looking, much less of a statement piece. And I want to read another quotation from Bob Probst. While I read it, think about the Action Office design and also think about the Knoll interiors that I showed you earlier. These offices were devoid of the imprint of work or process. I call it the clean desk syndrome. At the end of the day, ideally, you had no bodies or paper showing. It was so sterile. The CBS building in New York was an interesting example. In there, you could not choose anything yourself except maybe a picture of your wife or your dog. So Probst was not interested in the aesthetics of the office the way George Nelson was. He was interested in the use. And because Action Office had not been as successful as intended, Probst was allowed to continue his research and cross the finish line he had initially been aiming for. In 1968, he modified the Action Office and instead of focusing on the individual design of the desks, Props looked at the components, the partitions, the desks, the shelves that attached to them, and created a whole office that was completely mobile and easy to remake. There's a series of patents for the Action Office too, and they're not design patents protecting what something looks like, and they're not utility patents that talk about the clipping mechanisms. They're patents that talk about creating flexible workspaces. Action Office 2 was not traditional furniture. The desks have no legs. They're not even freestanding. It's a larger structural system. Also, this is not a grid-based system. This is based on triangular connections that create irregular, flexible spaces. And this allows both private spaces and public spaces by intent. You can see in this picture somebody working at their desk. Behind them is an adjustable angled table for, for drafting or drawing. Behind that is a tack-up space where people could talk about their work. The whole premise is that there are separate components that are easy to assemble. Here's a utility patent for the connection method, and I'm sorry the picture on the right is a more recent one, and I suspect that the connection mechanism has matured over the years. I've never been able to find any pictures of hardware from 1968. That's my bucket list. But you can see that there are separate panels and there's an expandable clip that clips the two of them together. They also developed a chase at the bottom so you could run wiring right through the panels. At the time, there were different tax regulations for writing off architectural expenses or construction expenses and furniture. Furniture could be depreciated over time. So if you turn architecture into furniture, you're allowing corporations to have a better tax position on some of their expenses. The drawing on the right is one of the most beautiful ones I will show you all semester. Any of my students struggling with perspective drawings and understanding how to apply line weight should study this drawing. It's a two line weight drawing in perspective. Object lines help you distinguish the different components. But even if you don't appreciate it as a drawing, it really beautifully shows the intent behind Action Office 2. On the lower left, you can see a reception desk, low walls, and somebody sitting at that would be able to see everyone coming in. Across from that is an enclosed area with a transparent wall, so the person in there might want to monitor who's coming in but not have to talk to them. Beyond that, there are individual workspaces, and in the background you can see completely enclosed conference rooms. So the same system of components allows every kind of space you would need in a healthy office. Probst wrote, It's truly amazing the number of decisive events and critical dialogues that occur when people are out of their seated, stuffy contexts and moving around and chatting with each other. One of the ideas behind Action Office is that it would be arranged and installed by design with assessment of the office workings and then rearranged after assessment. So the Herman Miller sales agents would have conversations about what needed to happen in the office. They'd set the equipment up and then they'd go back and tweak things and move them around to make sure the furniture system was supporting the activities that needed to happen. Here are some photographs of those systems in action. And you can, see the, the, you can see the really engaging range of types of spaces and interactions that are happening there. And those are black and white pictures. When you see the color pictures from the era, you also begin to understand another layer of flexibility, which is that it was imagined to be updated over time. The fabric panels in these pictures are very 1968, but they didn't have to stay that way. 
Okay, I want to read you another props quotation, but I have to say a word that makes me cringe. See if you can spot when that happens. We tried to create a low-key, unselfconscious product that was not at all fashionable. The action office was supposed to be invisible and embellished with identity and communication artifacts and whatever you needed to create individuation. We tried to escape the idea of being stylish, which is gone in five years. We wanted this to be the vehicle to carry other expressions of identity. One of the most exciting things about good design work is that it creates objects or systems or solutions that open doors no one knew were there. That's what happened with the Action Office as well. People began to install Action Office in innovative ways that hadn't been considered when it was designed. If you set your system up with the shelving up higher and an open panel behind them, you've now made a workstation with a pass-through. And that could be used as a sort of dispensary. So these started to be installed in hospitals, in pharmacies, as a workstation with a controlled public access. This took Herman Miller in whole new directions that ended up creating a whole new division, Herman Miller Healthcare. You have seen these in every pharmacy and doctor's office that you've ever been to. This is really big business. And this does not come out of props realizing that Herman Miller could be designing for pharmacies and hospitals. It comes at solving the problem of creating flexible workspaces and then seeing where those workspaces could fit. Unfortunately, all of the really, really good research that Props did and all of the really great design work that went into Action Office 2 is not what we remember when we think about this work. In addition to creating an entirely new division at Herman Miller, Props accidentally unleashed an entirely new beast, which is the cubicle. Instead of getting all of that beautiful flexibility and irregularity and eccentricity and color and textiles and houseplants, we got the bleakness of the cubicle. These are pictures from the Herman Miller website about 10 years ago to show you what it had turned into even at Herman Miller. The problem was that very, very quickly, lots of other manufacturers made a version of this. Props counted as many as 42 competitors making versions of a wall system for offices. And they didn't bother with the niceties of a triangular joint and different height walls and transparent sections. They made grids. The goal became cramming as many workers and equipment into the least amount of space possible. Many people now blame Bob Props for the birth of the cubicle, and I think that's grossly unfair because the path that led him there was such a pure and wonderful and successful one. So cut the guy a break, huh? Okay, this is gonna be really clumsy. This is not well thought out or well supported, but it gets us to a finish line of some kind. I want to look at some of the equipment that's filling up these offices because it's kind of amazing how little office equipment changed over the decades. Remember that before electronics transformed our world, things were mechanical. So for a really long time, objects couldn't change much because the mechanisms inside so completely constricted what the outsides could be. And it's especially rewarding when you can look at one company that made the same object through many decades over the course of a multiple styles or, or interests. And the great Italian designer Marcello Nizzoli, who designed for Olivetti, did a number of their calculators. You can see that all the way back in 1946, the form was pretty much set. And so over time, the outer housing can get more rounded or less rounded. It could get a matte finish or a shiny finish. It could be painted. It could be enameled. You could add a plastic hood. I think it's sort of fascinating that the 1967 version on the right, to me, is the least successful of these designs because they were having trouble bringing this design into the modern age. And just for contrast and kind of for a laugh, I want to show you the transition that started to happen when mechanical things could become electronic. On top is the Olivetti Elettrosuma from 1964, with and without its housing. So you can see the inside is all stamped sheet metal and gears, completely mechanical methods of creating addition. On the bottom is one of the very earliest electronic calculators. It was introduced in 1967, and it works with a magnetic core memory. So it used magnets to store digits. This is mind-blowing to me. It has all those rows of cards that contain magnets because magnets are binary. It's positive or negative. It's a one or a zero. The magnets would flip to create a sequence of ones and zeros and allow this device to do basic math. It's still just as big as its predecessor. So it's a great example of early electronics not really improving the object, but opening the door to a different kind of future that was eventually better. And amazingly, this was still in production 10 years later in 1976. 
We could look at any piece of office equipment and see the same kind of trajectory, decades of stagnation. Typewriters had not changed much. They were still pretty clumsy things. You conceal the mechanical insides under some kind of casing that became more curved over time and less curved over time, that became dark green or light green. The big radical thing that Royal did in 1955 was introduce a pink typewriter. And it wasn't until electronics and computers arrived that this landscape could really change into anything you would recognize as today's office. But there is one office triumph that we need to look at, and it allows me to sneak Elliot Noyes in the conversation also. Noyes is largely responsible for getting design into the office through his long-term association with IBM. He graduated with a degree in architecture from Harvard, and he went to work for Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer's firm, and then he went to the MoMA, where he was director of industrial design from 1940 until 1945 or 1946. And while at the MoMA, he helped promote the Eames's work. So he was also, like Florence Knoll, really well connected and sort of perfectly positioned to make some important contributions to progress in design. He also was design director for Norman Belgettis after World War II, where he got to work on a typewriter redesign for IBM. IBM approached the Belgettis office to redesign the typewriter on the upper left. And this project got off the ground just as Norman Belgettis was having to fold his firm and close his office. Noyes did a really smart thing. He went to IBM and said, that typewriter project that's almost finished, I've been working on it the whole time. So why don't you hire me and I'll finish the project for you. And this led to a consultancy with IBM for the next 21 years. I'm sneaking in one more slide about this project because the Belgettis office kept such good process records, which are all now at the Ransom Center at UT Austin. This is a photograph of the before. This is the existing typewriter. And they've drawn right on the photograph to indicate the existing dimensions and the proposed new dimensions, because they weren't really able to completely redesign the inside components and understanding the limitations of the physical components of that existing design was an important part of this project. And then on the right, you can see a copy of the rendering of the final design that Noyes has used to add callouts to explain all of the different design features that are added to this typewriter. And I just thought those documents are too nice not to show you. So that typewriter design was interesting because it got Noyes working with IBM. But what that relationship led to was the first major redesign that typewriters had since their invention in the 1880s. The IBM Selectric debuted 12 years after the Model A. It took seven years to design. I want to describe some of the changes so you can appreciate how exciting this typewriter was. The most important thing is you could have different typefaces. You could even have different fonts of the same typeface if you wanted to. The die-cast metal golf ball had the letters, and that clipped on to a carriage that was controlled by three different loop ribbons that would move the carriage where it needed to go on the page, rotate the ball to get the right letter facing forward, and tip it forward to contact the page. So really remarkably complicated engineering to make this work. And if you ever get a chance to use one, do. It's like magic. It's so much fun to watch this ball somehow understand what you want it to do and put the letter you meant to put on the page right there in front of you. Also because the ball moved, there was no longer any need for the carriage to go back and forth. So this typewriter could arrive at this beautiful shape because it didn't need to also incorporate a huge sliding trough at the top. And instead of merely using electricity to make pressing the keys easier, as all earlier electric typewriters had done, this new system allowed you to touch the keys so much more lightly, it took much less effort to push down the keys while typing. And those changes allowed most people to go from 50 words a minute to 90 for just normal typing skills. And now because there are no more levers, to bring the type onto the paper, there is no more jamming that can happen. There are almost 3,000 separate parts in this typewriter, all of them designed and manufactured from scratch. The number of Selectrics that IBM projected they would sell in the first six months ended up selling in the first 30 days. And the first year's projections of 20,000 typewriters ended up becoming 80,000 typewriters. In the end, more than 13 million Selectrics were sold, and they were not cheap. They were $395 when new, which is about $3,500 today. Because the keys needed less force to press them down, the entire shape of the keyboard could change. It was lowered, it's on less steep of an angle, because it no longer needed to meet your fingers at their strongest point. 
And again, because the carriage return was removed, the exterior shell could be really sculptural. One of my frustrations with this as an Elliott Noyes design is that 99% of what made this typewriter so extraordinary was the work of the engineers at IBM. Noyes came in and gave it a really beautiful shell, but I wish that some of those engineers could share in the glory of having their name attached to this typewriter. Nevertheless, there is one aspect of this typewriter that Noyes introduced that I think is so extraordinarily important that we're going to revisit it in two weeks when we look at computers, and that's the shape of the keys. Unlike earlier typewriters, where the keys were independent and there was space around them, these are square at the bottom, so at their base there's sort of a complete surface with no openings, but then at the top they are concave in a way that meets your finger. Here's another clumsy Matthew metaphor for you. It's like what if a square Lego had an upside down contact lens on the top? And Noyes called this the squircle. It's a square at the bottom and a circle at the top. That shape became the template for every computer keyboard until about five years ago. So we'll revisit that because I think it's one of the single most important advances in human machine interface. And so as a result, I am happy to have Elliot Noyes' name as the only one attached to the Selectric solely on the strength of the squircle. And I know that was a sloppy ending, but remember that it was a sloppy ending to an even sloppier, larger narrative. That was a three-pronged, two-week poke at talking about mid-century design and watching it age into a celebration of marketing and consuming and corporate culture, which also allowed designers to shift their focus from the home, where it had been for more than 100 years, into environments where it hadn't been so present, like the workplace. There's one more chapter this week, which is Buckminster Fuller. Why is Buckminster Fuller part of this conversation? Because where else does he fit? You could put Buckminster Fuller in the 1920s when he was trying to rethink architectural structure and prefabrication. You could put him in the 30s when he was applying streamlining to transportation. You could put him in the 40s when he was looking at post-war kit manufacturing for housing. You could put him in the 1960s when his architectural structural spheres transformed our thinking about architecture, or you could put him in the 1970s when he was part of the earliest, most important work in changing our thinking about the environment. So he doesn't fit anywhere slash he fits everywhere. I've decided to give him his own chapter and just stick it in where I had room. So I'll get that one to you this week. And then next week, join me for a conversation about plastic. You know what? I'm going to make this bigger so I can actually see what's on the screen. Reesom's most identifiable bot. <laughs> I can't say ident identifiable. Maybe if I say it in a funny voice. Identifiable. Reesom's most identifiable chair. She's not holding a mop in that photograph. That's her dog. And it's just a tragedy of bad cropping that makes it hard to understand. Sorry. Sorry, pooch. Scratch the face. What's it called? Why am I chair? <laughs> when did when did Hans Noll die? Hans Noll died. When did Hans Noll die? When Siri? When did Hans Noll die? And was it in a car crash in Cuba? I think it was a car crash in Cuba. In nineteen, I was right. A Porsche in Cuba runaway truck, 41 years old. He was a child, 1955. Oh, dear. Oh. Oh. Where do I talk about the, um... God, did I just forget to say it? I don't think I did. Well, I hope it's coming up. We could look at any piece of off a we could look at any piece of Offica. <laughs> Offica? Offica? Office? Office. You could put him in the 50s when he introduced, what are those things called? Uh, spheres. What's that thing Fuller made? It's a sphere. It's a, it's a sphere. Biosphere of man. What's the, what's the Buckminster Dome? Buckminster Dimaxian Dome. Okay. You know what I get to do now? I get to go have ice cream. 